Hi, you're listening to the My Care Champion Cast. I'm Lucy Shimatero of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Today, we'll be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic with Dr. Lydia Watson, who is Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at MidMichigan Health. We'll learn more about Dr. Watson's personal journey throughout the pandemic, along with how she and her frontline staff found hope and healing through some of the most challenging months of 2020. We'll also spend some time debunking commonly told myths about the COVID-19 vaccines. So with that, I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Watson. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with me today. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Absolutely. And I think um, to kick off the show, it, it would be helpful for our listeners, if, if you don't mind, giving some background on your role at MidMichigan Health and maybe briefly describe what led you to MidMichigan Health. Sure. Uh, at MidMichigan Health, I am currently the System Chief Medical Officer. And in my role, I currently oversee quality, patient safety, risk management, physician services, population health, provider engagement and well-being, and I also oversee our employed physician enterprise. I actually grew up in the Detroit area, but did my OB-GYN residency training in Saginaw, while my husband, who I met in medical school, did his family medicine residency in Midland. Our first home together actually was in Midland, and interestingly enough, after our training, we realized that we felt at home in the Great Lakes Bay region and decided to stay. During that time, I actually joined a practice in Saginaw, and over the eight years I was there, I watched MidMichigan Health grow and provide excellent leading-edge care. And after those eight years, I, with two of my partners from Saginaw, opted to join MidMichigan Health. And I've been there ever since. And that was in 1996. Wow. Well, it sounds like you've explored enough of the state to, to know that you're, you've got just the right fit where you are. So that's, that's great. Yep. Feels like home for sure. That's wonderful. And I know we spoke briefly before today's call and and you mentioned as a chief medical officer, you wouldn't traditionally describe yourself as a frontliner, um, but you were very much involved on the front lines um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So can you describe what that experience was like and and maybe just take us back to the early days and and peak months of the pandemic from from your perspective? Sure. And and I think you make a very good point that although I wasn't directly providing patient care during those months as chief medical officer, I was responsible for making sure a lot of things took place and that our patients and employees safety was always our primary concern. So I walked the halls. Um, I was one of the first ones outside of the tents outside of our emergency room when we started doing COVID testing. So, you know, I would tell you that overall, it it really has been like a roller coaster ride, or um, I might even describe it as being in a whirlwind. We initially had PPE shortages. PPE is that personal protective equipment. And so a lot of people frustrated, a lot of people anxious uh, about that. And the, the most important thing to remember is this was a brand new virus. None of us had seen it before. Nobody in the world had seen it before. So there was a fear of the unknown. We didn't have certain treatments. We had frequently changing recommendations, sometimes daily, sometimes more than daily. And we were taking care of very sick patients. Uh, Our staff and frontline workers were really worried about being exposed to the virus and taking it home. They didn't know when they walked home if they had to change their clothes in the garage and put new clothes on. We also had to figure out real quickly how to take care of COVID and non-COVID care patients at the same time and uh, make sure that everybody remains safe while doing so. Um, I I would tell you that one of the things that we found real early is we, we had to learn to be flexible. And it didn't matter if you spend a whole day coming up with a plan. If you got new information, you had to sit down again, turn around and face the new information and come up with a different plan. So we really learned to be f- flexible. We, we also found a tremendous need for communication at every level. As I was dealing with the anxiety of frontline staff and, and of our patients and early on of visitors, um, 
we had to make sure that we were communicating and communicating in multiple ways so that people were up to date on the latest things that we were uh, recommending and encouraging everybody to do. Absolutely. And I think it's it's worth noting and shouldn't be overlooked that you're not just a chief medical officer, just like our frontliners aren't just hospital staff, they're parents, they're children, they have friends and family and loved ones. And I, I can't imagine working under the circumstances you were on top of just personal stress and anxiety. How did you manage that? How did you um, manage your stress on top of the, the needs of your frontline staff and, and patients? Yes, you're you're exactly right. the The stress was palpable. It was palpable everywhere we went, and so the most important thing was to show up with a smile, and words of thanks for what everyone was doing, um, trying to coach and mentor and comfort others, and that helped to not only relieve our uh, employees' anxiety but my own as well, because I had a focus. And if I could focus on what was needed now and what I needed to do to help others and get information to others, rather than worrying about what happened yesterday or worrying about what might happen tomorrow or next week, we just had to figure out what we needed to do that day to get everybody through it and to try to keep everybody positive. Uh, I I would tell you that one of the most helpful things that I did was read. I I was reading into the wee hours of the night every night because knowledge is powerful and it Mm -hmm. helps to quell fear. Um, You talked earlier about needing to debunk some myths. And whenever we had accurate information that could lead to some good decision making, that also helped to decrease everybody's stress and anxiety links back to that word flexibility. Um, Flexibility and balance go hand in hand. And I'm sure you and others had to find that um, leaving the hospital, you had to find your your ways to self-soothe and find balance and flexibility in managing your own health. That's exactly right. And and sometimes it was tough. Um, And so sometimes it was simple as saying, okay, when was the last time you ate? You need to make sure that you're eating. You need to make sure that you're taking some breaks. Sometimes it was just to go around the corner and uh, stand there, close my eyes and take a couple of deep breaths and say, okay, we've got this, keep going. Um, The other thing that I do personally that was exceptionally um, critical to me staying mentally healthy was exercising. So I had Mm -hmm. to try to maintain my normal exercise regimen as much as possible. Yeah. And I I saw you served six years in um, an Army National Guard evac hospital. I guess I'm curious, what would you say comparatively COVID-19 was like um, to that experience? You know, it was, it's really interesting. Uh, That's a great question. And I would tell you that in many ways, uh, being in that military uh, role for an evacuation hospital trained me to deal with some of the things that we dealt with in the pandemic. So I Mm -hmm. was used to having to uh, rally literally troops to respond to crisis and and emergencies. And so that probably actually helped uh, me in some of the planning phases of what we were doing within our healthcare system. So now we're in a place where there's some hope and uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Uh, The governor today announced that uh, mask and gathering limits would be lifted uh, in July. So I'm wondering, before this point, as things progressed, can you just share any moments or stories of hope um, or just instances that offered some healing or comfort to you and the frontliners? Sure. Uh, Two in particular come to mind. And talk about making history. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And then, uh, unfortunately, in Midland, we had a flood in May of 2020, uh, right smack dab in the middle of that first wave. We, uh, in our Midland uh, hospital, ended up having to close down two units, one of them being uh, one of our intensive care units. And so we were at a point where literally we were dealing with two disasters at the same time. And when frontline staff saw everyone step up to help, it really did create hope and healing. 
Uh, we had leaders whose own homes had flooded who didn't even go home to check on their homes and offered to stay at the hospital to selflessly help staff and patients to make sure everyone was cared for and safe. Uh, other hospitals in the Great Lakes Bay region actually reached out to us even before we had to call them and said, hey, we know you guys may be in trouble. We were slammed and really busy ourselves, but we're happy to help take care of your sick patients if needed. And so I think just to see how when bad things happen, the goodness comes out in everyone and everyone just rallied around to help us, um, help us as healthcare workers and help our patients and help our employees. So that was uh, very important, I think, in, in our whole timeline. And then um, another touching story was re recently shared by one of our West Branch nurses she uh, was a floor nurse, um, worked through all three phases of COVID, needed to socially distance from her elderly father who was living by himself alone. And she was concerned about the possibility of unknowingly exposing him to COVID if she had it and didn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. So they had a discussion and she just said, you know, I'll call you every day and remain in contact with you, but we really probably shouldn't see each other in person. So uh, that's what they did. And then sadly, one day, he didn't answer his phone uh, in the morning. And she called later that afternoon, still didn't answer. And so she sent her husband to check on him. And unfortunately, her father was found to have passed away by himself at home. And when she shared that with us, she just voiced that although he was not directly killed and impacted by COVID, that she truly believes that he was indirectly killed by COVID because of loneliness and a broken heart. And it's just so sad, but because of that, she's now an advocate of getting vaccinated to help end the loneliness and sadness that isolation has caused during the pandemic. And, you know, it's not just about you and your preferences choosing to get vaccinated. It's get vaccinated for your elderly neighbors, get vaccinated for your family members that you haven't been able to interact with. And so her message is very much one of hope and healing. Absolutely. And I'm glad she could take away from that experience how important it is just to be an advocate. And and as we jump to the present, we do now have three safe and effective vaccines available. And we received news last week that the Pfizer vaccine is authorized for children ages 12 to 15. So just I want to ask you off the bat, would you encourage parents and guardians uh, to take their children to get vaccinated? Absolutely. Uh, I encourage everyone to be vaccinated. This is exciting new information that we have found the Pfizer vaccine to be safe in uh, younger uh, adolescents and children from the age of 12 through 15. It's safe and highly effective, 100% in that initial trial. So I encourage parents to have their children vaccinated and um, as they're taking their children, they should be getting vaccinated themselves if they haven't already. Yes, yes. And I think it's important to acknowledge that hesitancy is expected, but it's really important to understand and hear from experts like yourself um, that these vaccines were developed and approved with no shortcuts on safety um, and they're safe and effective, all three of them. So before I let you go, uh, I do want to take some time just to have you debunk common myths uh, that are related to the vaccines. There's a lot of information out there. Um, and while some people may see, you know, the myths as silly or ridiculous, uh, some genuinely believe that this stuff is true. So I just want to emphasize that no question uh, is stupid, is a stupid question when it comes to your health. And uh, it's really just important to get your information from a qualified, credible source, um, which you are. So that's um, kind of why I want to dive into this. Uh, the first myth out there, which I'm sure you've heard, is that vaccines can or will give you COVID-19. Uh, yes, and first I would say I agree with you 100%. At this point, there is no question that is silly um, uh, and shouldn't be addressed. And my current thinking is, is that with those that haven't gotten the vaccine yet, it's important for us to meet them. 
uh, they shouldn't be expected to meet us and our opinions. And so it is important to ask, why are you hesitant? What are you fearful of? Or what questions can I answer or we answer to maybe change your mind? And so the first is a great question. Um, can you get COVID by getting the vaccine? And the good news is the absolute answer is no, you cannot, absolutely not, because the vaccine contains no live virus. So you will not get COVID from the vaccine, not from any of the vaccines that we have right now. And in the same vein, you would say that side effects, uh, minor side effects from the vaccine are normal. And actually, I've heard they mean that the vaccine is actually working. Uh, yes, in many cases, it's a sign that the vaccine is working. Great. And I have a couple that um, I, I'll just pair together and have you tackle them together. The the okay. next being there are microchips in the COVID-19 vaccine or the vaccines will alter your DNA. Yes. Yeah, so there are no microchips in any of the vaccines that are currently available. So that means the vaccine can't track you as a person or gather personal information. Those are the two biggest reasons for being concerned that there might be a microchip chip embedded somewhere. Um, the other thing is the reason why people are concerned that these vaccines might alter your DNA is because they've heard that Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA vaccines. But mRNA vaccines work by instructing cells in your body to make a protein that triggers an immune response against the COVID-19 virus. Once that messenger RNA or the um, mRNA breaks down, it disappears and after they've finished their job. So there is absolutely no, no concern that this is going to alter your cells in any way. Absolutely. And I think part of the reason information can be misleading is because there is some medical jargon that we're dealing with. So it's good that you break down things like mRNA because I, I personally didn't even know what that meant. Um, so another myth out there is that the vaccines, uh, we touched on this a little bit, but the vaccines were developed too quickly to be considered safe. Yes, and that is definitely not the case. When we break down what happened as these vaccines were being developed, the science was not rushed. mRNA vaccine technology, and that's what Pfizer and Moderna are, has been around for years. Uh, and during the trials, all safety protocols and testing processes were strictly followed. And then they were mm -hmm. monitored and reassured before the CDC actually gave us the emergency use authorization. I am uh, confident that the science was not rushed. Now, what happened quickly, and this might be the complicating factor here, is that uh, a number of big companies around the world invested large amounts of money and resources to get the vaccine developed so that it could be disseminated worldwide more quickly than usual and mm -hmm. have a major impact on the pandemic. Uh, the other reason why the vaccine could be produced uh, in the time frame that it was is because we had a number of volunteers step forward to enter the trials. It's not unusual to have a medical trial, and it'll take you a year to get people enrolled so that you have enough uh, patients in the study to be statistically significant when you're trying to determine determine whether it's a success or not. And so there were a lot of people that stepped forward right away um, to volunteer to be in those trials, and that helped tremendously. So one that's a, a bit more recent um, is that those who have gotten the vaccine can shed the virus to others as a result, um, other people who haven't gotten the vaccine. Right. And that's a, another great concern and a great question. And for a while, we didn't know. Uh, we didn't know that if you were vaccinated and you ended up being exposed to the COVID uh, virus and potentially even getting the COVID virus yourself, whether having had the vaccine would prevent you from spreading it to others or not. But mm -hmm. just within, like you said, recently, so a, a week ago, um, we now have studies that confirm that if you're fully vaccinated, so that means that you've had two shots of the Pfizer and Moderna or one of the J&J &J, and are mm -hmm. two weeks past having gotten the last dose, we now have um, nine months of data showing that the chance of you spreading COVID-19 are very, very low. 
And so it really shouldn't be a concern. Right. And while we're talking about the doses, um, some people think, oh, if I get the first dose, then I'm good and I don't need to get the second. Um, in the case of people who are, are getting Pfizer and Moderna, what are your thoughts there? Well, the first dose might be good uh, in and of itself, but when you again look at the statistics, it's only about 50% effective. So it's certainly better than nothing, but only 50%. So, you know, coin toss as to whether or not you're going to get COVID if you only get one dose. But by the time you get that second dose, that's what gives you the 94 to 95% efficacy. And uh, so we encourage you to follow the recommended number of doses based on which vaccine you're getting. Right, right. And vaccine side effects, I think, are, are probably the biggest conversation that people are having, um, just a fear of what could happen. And I think the Johnson & Johnson pause created a lot of hesitation in itself. Um, so one of the myths that I came across is the vaccine side effects are more dangerous and deadly than the virus itself. Yes, we actually know that um, the virus itself is more likely to cause death than uh, the vaccine. And most of the side effects from the vaccine are considered mild or moderate at worst and short-lived, meaning they're only going to be there for a couple of days. And so uh, I would tell you that it is still much safer to get the vaccine than it is COVID. If you get COVID, you certainly have a significant chance of ending up in the hospital, potentially on a ventilator in the intensive care unit. And there's now something called long haulers syndrome, which Mm. again, now that we're following some of these uh, individuals that had COVID a year ago, they're continuing to have symptoms for months and who knows how long afterwards. Uh, We're not seeing that from the vaccine. Can you touch on the the syndrome that's affecting kids as a result of COVID-19? Yes, it's a fascinating syndrome, but it is something that is potentially um, a real bad side effect of COVID. And so that multi-inflammatory syndrome causes uh, different parts of your body to have an inflammatory response. So things are attacking cells within these children's bodies, and it can cause um, a significant heart complication. And so again, that is something that when you look at in comparison to vaccines in the 12 year and above age group, we're seeing 100% effectiveness against the virus. And so they'll never have that inflammatory uh, effect if they if they get COVID. The great news to follow that is that we have a vaccine that's available to 12 to 15 year olds. So if, if you our near vaccine site, sign up, um, take care of yourself and your children and, and protect the community. Right. And, you know, the last thing that I have heard is I've had uh, some of our employees actually say, well, gosh, I had friends that got the COVID virus. It really wasn't that bad. Yeah, they might have been in bed and down for uh, two or three days, but then they bounced back. They're back at work. No big deal. But we know that if those individuals, even though they recovered, if they exposed a loved one, a child, uh, their parents, their grandparents, uh, the other people that they may have exposed unknowingly uh, certainly could have different responses and have more dangerous complications. Absolutely. And that brings up another great point that nobody is immune to the virus and nobody's immune to severe virus. Um, I just read a story about a 28 year old ER doc who was in that he was hospitalized. Mm-hmm. Anyone and he had he had no previous, you know, poor health history. It, it, it happens to anyone and people of all walks of life are being affected by the virus. So it's really, really important to, to get the vaccine and and know that your risk of a, a bad side effect is is slimmer than the risk of, of a severe reaction to COVID-19. Yes, I agree with you completely. And what we saw in this last wave uh, over the last few months is more of the variants, uh, variant strains of uh, COVID-19 virus showing up. And so 
viruses do what viruses do, and they will do anything to get a stronghold in the population to try to continue producing themselves in people. So they change, they alter, they do whatever it takes so that they can uh, continue infection. And if we don't get herd immunity, it allows these variants to keep popping up. And in this last variant that we saw, especially in Michigan, it was much more contagious. And surprisingly, mm -hmm. we were seeing younger people being admitted into the hospital and ending up in the ICU. And it w wasn't necessarily the same patient that was over 65 and had multiple uh, complicating medical conditions that made them at higher risk. Just like you mentioned that young ER physician who had no risk factors at all, it can impact anybody. And so yeah. to get rid of the uh, the variants, we've got to get rid of the pandemic. And the, and the best way to do that is to get vaccinated. Absolutely. And with that, I think that a great takeaway for our listeners would just be, we are, are looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. What can the community um, and, and listeners do to support their hospitals and support you and, and the frontliners who are still on the front lines. I mean, this is over for some people in their head because we, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we have a hospital workforce who is, hasn't gotten a break. How can we support mid Michigan health and, and other hospitals around Michigan? You know, I can tell you that in general, healthcare workers do what they do because they're passionate about taking care of people. And it doesn't take much to cheer them up or make them feel needed. Um, I can tell you that the community has showed up in their cars in our parking lots in support of us, honking horns and flashing signs of gratitude and thanks. And uh, if you saw the nurses looking out the windows as they're doing this, they all have tears in their eyes. Um, you know, it, it, uh, just saying thanks. And we know it's been rough and we appreciate everything you're doing. Um, little things. People will drop off a couple of pizzas for the healthcare workers in the emergency room or the ICU. Uh, for some reason, we in the healthcare field love to have food <laughs> donated to us. Who doesn't? <laughs> yes. And, you know, sometimes uh, it's just uh, handing out some homemade masks that are that make you smile you know they have funny faces or characters on them that make you laugh so it's it's little things like that that's that's all we need to keep going absolutely well that's great to know and i'm, I'm so glad i got a chance to ask you so thank you again dr watson for joining us today um where can listeners learn more about mid michigan health well, we actually do have a website. So if you just Google Mid Michigan Health, it will come up and there's all kinds of great information there. And uh, there is also a hotline number that is on that website. So if you have any specific questions about COVID, you're more than welcome to call that number as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you again. Um, and thank you to all who are tuning into the My Care Champion cast. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit MHA.org and be sure to join us for the next episode.